What are we seeing right now? What's going on? Let's go on and let's turn to Exodus chapter 32 and see what the people were seeing at that moment. Exodus 32. I really, and I could tell you all this stuff, but it's good that you see it too. And if someone says something to you, you can back it up with the word because you've been there. You've seen it yourself in the writing. Exodus 32, chapter 1. This time, we're leaving Zedekiah just for a moment, the 20th king. We're going to Exodus chapter 32. Moses is getting ready to go on Mount Zion. He is getting ready to, um, to talk to the Lord and to be with him. 32, Exodus chapter 1, verse 1, verse 1. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mountain, they gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods, which shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not, we don't even know, what has become of him. What is going on? They are tired of waiting. But I'm tired of waiting on God. But don't you remember the fear of the Lord? We're in the month of Tammuz, the month of the golden calf. This is the 17th day of the month of Tammuz, which is July 4th for us. This is all in the same area, not the same year, but the same time, time, front, time frame of the year I'm talking about. People did not want to wait on Moses to come down. All he had to do was look up. Exodus chapter 25. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, don't, 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 don't let me forget. Exodus chapter 24, and I'm going to go to verse 17 because I want to show you what they were looking at, but they wasn't taking advantage of. And Moses, verse 15, went up into the mount, and a cloud covered the mountain, and the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days, and the seventh day he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud. And in the sight of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. Look here. Moses is just going up. And he's still up in, verse, in chapter 32. But he's going up and what do they see? The mountain is like devouring fire on top of it. Can you imagine just look around thinking, oh my gosh, Moses is going up there Whoa! It was always on fire. It was huge. And just if we would go back a few more chapters, we would find out when they arrived at Mount Sinai and Moses said God was going to come down. It was lightning. It was thunder. It was like a, a furnace was wrapped around the mountain. The people were so scared. They said, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Moses, why don't you go talk to God? But we're too scared. Whatever he says to do, we'll do it. Okay, gotcha. Because there's, listen, this was not just a, a, a flicker of a match. This is an amazing time. They had seen this mountain on fire. That, that it made them tremble because of the earthquakes. That, that, then they see Moses go up and it's like a fire on the top. But all of a sudden, why is it? I just lost my desire. More people leave us, the house of God, because they lose their desire not because we've wounded them or we've offended them or we didn't let them do what they wanted to do. They just get tired of seeing the fire. All they had to do was look up and they would have seen the devouring fire on top of the mountain knowing that Moses was there. Moses will come down. Keep the faith. Don't turn back. But they couldn't. Come on, just make me something that I can, that I can worship, Aaron. Get, 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 here's some gold, Aaron. The month of the golden calf. This is the month that this happened in. I don't care anymore. I, 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 I'm desensitized. I, I, my ears are dull of hearing. And, and, and I don't want to. Let's just give me something. Remember I've told you before, people want a God they can control. They want a God that, 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 that has no eyes, that, that, but they can't see. That they want to make a God that has ears, but they can't hear. They want, they want a God that has hands, but it can't hold you. A God that has legs, but it can't walk. They got to pick up their own God and take it where they want it. Our God takes us where he wants us. That's what I love about our God. 
He's a consuming fire. Up on that mountaintop, there they were. But guess what? The children didn't care. They had corrupted themselves by making false gods out of gold, which is the one thing God said, don't do. Don't make other gods. Don't make gold and make false gods out of them. Come on. Trust me. Believe me. Rely on me. Zedekiah, let me tell you what happened. The enemy broke in. But Moses right there on Mount Sinai, when he come down after 40 days, the people had corrupted themselves. And honestly, they quit focusing on God. They just didn't care. And God just didn't matter no more. That's usually why the enemy comes in, because we don't care. Just leave the door unlocked, leave it open, windows grazed. Come on, come on in. We got to start caring. Something's got to shift. Something's got to happen. That was Tammuz the 17th. That was July 4th. That was almost like two full weeks from now. But there's one more thing that happens in the next month. After the month of Tammuz is the month of Av. And on the ninth day of Av, something else happened. The ninth day of Av is Friday. The first day Randy comes to us. So if he says what day it is, you say, I know. Tell him you know what day it is. It's the ninth day of Av. And now we're going to go to another place in our Bible. We're going to go to where Moses sends out those 12 spies. And that's found in, I lost it. Hmm. Numbers. Numbers chapter 13. From the time of Mount Sinai to the time the 12 spies go out, I've heard between one to two years, maybe like 38 more years before the end, or two years into their journey in the wilderness, if those uh, calculations are correct from what I've heard. Moses has sent out 12 men to go and spy out, to search the land of Canaan, to just see what's there, to just see who's there, to just see it and check it out. So after 40 days, they all come back to Moses. We know the story, but Moses asked him, how did it go? Well, let me tell you what I've seen. I've seen some big old grapes. I've seen some great land. I've seen some wonderful things. I mean, they've seen rivers. They may have seen some high mountains. They've seen all kinds of things. And, but then two of them, remember, said, ah, I've seen something else. I seen somebody really tall and big. I seen something I don't think I can conquer. I don't think we can take care of this. I don't know, they said. But said, <clears throat> but let's go to numbers. Let's go to chapter 13, verse 25. And they returned from their search of the land after 40 days. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel and to the wilderness of Paran and to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and to the congregation showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, We came into the land whither thou sent us and surely it flowed with milk and honey and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land and the cities are walled and great, very great and moreover, we saw the children of Achan there. And the Am Am Amalekites dwelt in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jezebites and the Amorites dwelt in the mountains, and in the Canaanites dwelt by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. But Caleb stilled the people before Moses. Shh, let us go at once. Come on, let's possess it. Come on, for we are all well able to overcome it. But the other men that went up with him said, No, 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 no. We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land the which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up its inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Achan, which come Anak which come of the giants. Here's the thing. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. Some people don't think they're much. And if I am much, little in my eyes, 
I assume I am little in your eyes. If I don't count my ministry, my life for much, what do I expect you to see it? Or I expect you to see, I assume you see what I see. A uh, couple months ago, you know, I've been doing hair for 31 years. And sometimes I think to myself, can't you do any better than that? 31 years. And uh, when I think that, I think sometimes other people think that. And uh, uh, that's not true. That's not true. I mean, just a few months ago, I cut this lady's hair, and then she cried when I was through because she felt so pretty. Wow. But we have that mentality. If I think I'm nothing, I assume you think I'm nothing. And if I don't value my life, I assume you don't value my life. And that stopped them, discouraged them, and frightened them from stepping out like Caleb said. We can do this. Come on, let's go. No, 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 no. I am not good enough. I am too small. I am too weak. And it cost them 40 years more wandering in the wilderness because they thought they wasn't good enough. But they really thought God wasn't big enough. God said he would take them through. I've got your back. I'll stand by your side. We'll take these people down. God had them. But they wouldn't do that. And God asked them this question. How long will it be before you believe me? How long? With the people. How long will it be before you'll believe me? Some people don't think they're good enough. But they should remember, with God, all things are possible. With God, I can do all things. The enemy has come in. And people have grown bored and tired of waiting. Because some people just don't think they got it in them. But you know what? There's some people that's got too much in them. So let's go to 1 Samuel and we'll talk about somebody. 1 Samuel. Chapter 15. We're going to talk about chapter 15, 1 Samuel, verse 28. So let me tell you where we're going. There's a man who is now the first king of Israel, and his name is Saul. Saul started out good, but he wasn't ending up very good because I think he got too much of himself in himself. So Samuel, a great man of God. I mean, his words did not fall from Dan to Beersheba. Everybody listened to Samuel. Samuel was a great man, raised in the temple by Eli the judge. I mean, he was just right out wonderful. But now he's come to talk to Saul because Saul's getting ready to be rejected and be getting ready to be what, rejected from God. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 28 says this, and Samuel said unto him, The Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day and has given it to thy neighbor of thine that is better than thou. And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man that he should repent. I'm going to read verse 30 in the Amplified. And Saul said, I have sinned, yet honor me now, I pray you, before the elders of my people and before Israel, and return with me, that I may worship the Lord your God. Wait, I know you're going to take my anointing away. I know I'm going down. I know it's gone, but wait, would you make me look good before the people? Would you go with me, Samuel? Would you make me look good? I know it's gone. Nobody knows it, but I want to look good. Make, walk with me that I look like I'm the king of Israel. Look with me that I am somebody. I've got a title. I've got a name. I've got a position. I've got an account. I've got something. So walk with me. I don't care about that anointing as long as I look good up here. Oh, my gosh. That's called pride. When we care more about all that other stuff, what people think, then we care about what God thinks. I'd rather be someone who thought a little less of themselves 
than someone who thought a little more of themselves. Because God can always help you up. But it's hard. I don't want him to strike me down. Or, you know, p- place me down where I belong, you know. Rather than kind of love me up than, than, than to have to, um, to take me down. So now we have two kinds of people in the world. We have people that need to be encouraged who think they're small and not good enough. And yet we also have people who think they're too good and don't need God. But what the Bible says in Proverbs 16 and 18, pride comes before the... Now let's go to somewhere that fell. Let's go to Genesis. Let's go back to Genesis. Our last one today. Let's go to Genesis. I don't know where. Oh... I don't know why I do notes for. Let me just go to Genesis and go right here to Genesis chapter 19, chapter 20. Okay. If you was to just, uh, we'll get to 20 just in a minute. If you was to start out in Genesis chapter 12, you would start out learning about the man named Abraham. Had God told Abraham, I'm going to make you, you know, a, a, a father of many nations. Uh, I'm, you're going to have many seed, uh, uh, like the sand of the earth and the stars of the sky. I'll bless them that bless you. I'll curse them that curse you. And then he goes on. And then God tells Abraham, he wants you to leave his family. I want you to go out to a place where I send you. So Abraham and his wife, Sarah, took off, but the lot came with them. Lot is Abraham's brother's son, his nephew. He comes with them that day, and it wasn't long before the Bible says that Abraham's herdsmen and Lot's herdsmen seemed to have some friction going on between them. They were having some fighting going on. Abraham, who loved Lot, said, Lot, we got to part. I mean, I would rather almost be separated from you than have that strife with you. So Lot... I want you to look around and tell me, where do you want to live? Lot looked around and said, wow, I'll go over there. You know, he's seen a lot of, um, is that like, um, like the Garden of Eden? Must have seen some plush ground and trees and grass. He's seen water. And if you've got a lot of cattle, I want to go where the water is to feed my cattle. And Abraham said, okay. And Lot went toward that way, which is toward the east, toward a place called Sodom. Sodom, Gomorrah, uh, a, a lot of cities in that area. So you have the people, you've got the land, you've got the water. That was wise for Lot to go. And, and Abraham went the other way. Well, a couple years go by and don't hear too much. Abraham has some conversations with God and there's things going on in his life. Then the Bible says later on that those five cities where uh, Lot was at, well, there were four kings over here against these five kings over here. Now, they were to pay tribute, and they were supposed to be underneath these kings. Well, one day, they decided to rebel and not do it. So those five kings where Lot lived at was coming to have had four kings coming down on them to battle. Four kings against five kings, all was going crazy, and, and the fight was going on, and all of a sudden, they won. And those four kings who came against the king of Sodom and Gomorrah, which is the area that Lot lived in, those four kings went in and took like the spoil, the good things, the possessions of the cities. And guess what they took? Lot! They took Lot and his possessions, made his wife or the things that Lot had. Well, all of a sudden, somebody ran away and got word to Abraham. Abraham, Abraham, Lot's been taken. What? 318 men that he had raised and, and, and taught in his own house went with Abraham to go fetch Lot. I didn't say I didn't like you, just can't live with you. But if you need me, call me. And when it was called, Abraham went and got Lot and rescued him from who had him. Ten years go by, 12, 13, 14 years Lot's still living in Sodom. Everything's still going good as we know it until Abraham one day gets a phone call, gets a visit, knock on the door. He has a conversation with the Lord. 
And the God said, can I hide really what I'm going to do you know, from Abraham? He's my servant. I love Abraham. And he tells Abraham you know, that this place is going to go down. So here's all Sodom, and Abraham's talking to God, and, and it's going to go down. And Abraham said, yeah, we've heard that story. Abraham said, you know, if 50 people were good, would you save the city? He said, yeah. If 45 people were good, now, I, he's probably crying. But God, if we can find 45, will you let them live? If we can find 40, will you let them live? If we can find 35, 30, 25, down to 10, will you let them live? He said, yes. But you know, as the story goes, the angel shows up right there in Sodom, right in like the town square. Two, two angels, two, two men of God show up, and Lot knows exactly who they are. Sometimes you know who people are. You can see. You see the authority. You see the godliness in these men. He said, come to my house, said Lot to the man. Oh, no, we're going to stay right here, they said. He said, no, come to my house. So he urged them when they went into Lot's house. The men of the city come knocking on the door of Lot, and they wanted those men that were inside. And Lot said, no, 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 you cannot have these men. I have two virgin daughters. You can have them. And they said, no, 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 we want the men. And all of a sudden, the angels were able to get the two men, the angels were able to get Lot from behind the door back secure into his house. And then, poof, kind of blinded them. They kind of lost their sight, the men outside the door, and they went away. But then the men inside looked at Lot and said, Lot, do you got anybody else? You got any daughters? You got any sons? You got any son-in-laws? What do you got, Lot? And Lot said, well, yeah, I got to get some son-in-laws out there. So if he had son-in-laws, he had to have daughters, right? The two were in the house that were virgins, so they didn't have husbands. So the two out here that were sons-in-laws, I had to have some more daughters somewhere. But now here's where I split in my own head. When Lot goes out to talk to his sons-in-laws, he says, oh, there's going to be destruction. you got to get right with the Lord. you got to get right with the Lord. And they <laughs> thought he was joking. Did they think that Lot was joking because Lot said a lot of stuff but didn't walk in his ways? Was Lot not, not righteous? Was Lot, did, 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 you know, did talk the talk but not walk the walk? Or were they so blinded that they just didn't see? How many times have you told someone about Jesus and they laugh it off? They change the subject real quick because they're just not interested. They've lost their focus. And these guys just didn't care that night. I thought, Lot, were you not a good example? Or were you just so blind? And probably they were just so blind that anything that was said of anyone about anything, they just over their head. Remember, they lost focus like the children of Israel on the Mount of Sinai when Moses had gone up. That next morning, that angel said, go, 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 go. We got to go. Come on. We got to get out of here. We got to go. Escape for your life. Run for your life. Escape. What does escape mean? Break free from control. Whatever's got you bound, whatever's got you in bondage, escape for your life is at hand. Run, he said. Go, go, go. What did Lot go? No, he kind of lingered a little bit. And then, listen, I cannot... I cannot. I'm going to go to 19.22. Am I there? Am I there? Okay, yes, yes. 19.22 says, Haste thee, escape hither, for I cannot do anything till thou be hither. Oh, gosh. Let's go to the Amplified. 22. Make haste and take refuge there. I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zoar, which means little. The sun had risen over the earth when Lot entered Zoar. Then it happened. Listen. Until you enter the place where you're going. Wait. Enter in, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful with a few things. I'll make you ruler over many. Enter in. Until you enter in, until you arrive where you're going, ain't nothing going down here tonight. Nothing's going to take us under. The city's not going to be demolished. Nothing. I can't do anything, said the angel to Lot, until you get, till you enter, till you arrive to where you're going. We think this world is bad, but people ain't seen nothing yet. But by the time it comes to where it gets as bad as it's going to get, we're going to already enter in. We're we're going to already have arrived to the place where God has called us to be safe, to be by his side. It's not over till it says it's over. Until we have entered in, it is not over. Amen? Amen. Gosh, praise the Lord. Okay, listen to this this morning. All five stories we've talked about. Zedekiah, the walls are broken. 
We talked about Moses. People wasn't interested. They quit following. They were corrupting themselves. We go here to the ninth of Av where the spies has come in and to Canaan and come back with a negative report. We've also gone to Saul, negative report, but also thought little of themselves. Saul thought a lot of himself. And then we went over here to Lot where nothing's going to happen. In. Listen to this statement. We live among the enemy. Many people aren't focused on God. Our God, Jesus, Emmanuel, which being interpreted is Jesus with us. But there is corruption everywhere, but not everyone is participating. Some want to turn back from God. Others want to go forward without God. So the world isn't perfect, and neither are we. We need Jesus, and like Lot, we can tell people, but we can't make people. So we need to escape for our life, and don't turn back, because Jesus is coming. Amen. But did you notice one common thing in all three that she talked about from uh, Moses, the children of Israel, standing at the bottom of Mount Sinai? If they would have just looked up, they could, they could have had, they could remember where they came from. They could have remembered that they, that they were brought out of Egypt, was brought out of bondage, and, and they were at the place where God took them if they had just looked up. And then, you know, the, you, you got Saul, and, and he didn't care about that the Spirit of the Lord had left him, departed from him. The only thing he wanted to do was look good in front of the people. And then Lot in, in, in the people of Sodom, what was going on there. If you, if, if, and this hit me just sitting right there. It says there's one common thing in all three of these stories. And it's, it's one word. It's called pride. Pride. Pride was the, the, it was, I don't care about whatever, anything, anybody else said, I want what's best for me. And a lot of times that's the downfall of what we, and what we face today. Lucifer, if you, if you read in Ezekiel chapter 27, it says, until iniquity was found in thee and said you, you were lifted up in your heart, you know what his, his chief sin was? Pride. It's pride. You know, if you go to Proverbs chapter 6, I believe it's verse 17, it says six things that the Lord hates. You know what number one is? A proud look. Pride look. A proud look. Prideful. So that, that tells me we got to really, really be conscious of what we're doing to make sure we don't become a, have a proud look or become prideful in our heart. I always want to be humbled. And there's things that, that happen and things in my life that I've, I've seen and went through that's helped me to... Uh, it, it's humbling to see some things and to know some things. But you know what? The, the best way to humble ourselves is stay in the Word of God. If we stay in the Word of God, we will be humbled. We can't help but be humbled. You know, in, in Ezekiel, I believe it's 16 and 49, uh, well, it starts in verse 46, but in Ezekiel 49, it's talking really and truly about the sins of Sodom. If you've read it, we know what went on in Sodom, and that's where the Sodomites come from, and, and you, know, you know that part of it. But if you go back and, and you read Ezekiel 49, it says, Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, an abundance of idleness was in her and her daughters. Neither did they strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. Ezekiel is talking, about, he's talking to Jerusalem. And he's comparing Jerusalem at that particular time because they had got so wicked. They had got so far from God that they turned their back on God. And he says, you, Samaria, talking about uh, Jerusalem, you and Samaria are just like your sister and refer to them as a sister, Sodom, because of pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness. Well, we know what the pride is, that, that haughty look. That, proud, that being, being proud, saying, I, I like my way better than God's way. Fullness of bread. Well, we've got, all, we've got everything we need. We don't need to trust God. 
I've done this myself. I've worked hard all my life. I've done this. I've worked two jobs. I've worked overtime. I've done all this, and I've done this, and I've done that. You better be careful about saying I. Because in Ezekiel 28, when Lucifer was saying, he said, I will, I will, I will. I think it's five times Lucifer said, I will. And one time God said, no, you won't. And he was cast down. That's it. Pride, fullness of bread, I've got it all. I don't need, I don't need God in my life. And abundance of idleness. You know what happens? When you think you've got everything, you just quit and don't do nothing. Just lay back. I'm at ease. I'm at ease at the house. I don't have to do anything. You know, the Bible never says we don't have to do anything. Matter of fact, it says the people that don't do anything. Number one, if you don't work, you don't eat. That's what the Bible says. It says we're, we're supposed to be busy, occupy till I come, be about the Father's business. No word does he said, lay back, take it easy. Matter of fact, he said, the harvest is plenty, but what? The laborers are few. Now, I'm comparing all this, and I think you all know what I'm talking about, about America, where America is at today, where the United States, where this place that I once knew that I don't know anymore. This isn't the same country that I grew up in. This isn't the same place that our forefathers stood together in a little small place and says, we're going to sign this Declaration of Independence. And when I know I put my name on this, this paper and it, the war doesn't go our way, we're going to be held in treason and we're going to be either hung or shot at a firing squad. But they said, you know what? It's worth it. I'm going to do it anyway. It's talking about, I'm talking about what the Word of God is telling us, telling the church about where we are today. And it said... An abundance of idleness was in her heart and her daughters, neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor or the needy. There comes a time when we get such a proudful look, we don't care about anybody else. The only thing we want to care about, I've never seen such a time where there's such a me mentality. All about me. It's all about me. I don't care. I don't know how many times I've heard this. Well, I need you for you to see if you can go do this or would you go do that? Well, what's in it for me? That's usually the response you, you, you get. Well, what's in, why do I have to do that? Can't somebody else do that? What's in it for me? You think about Saul. You know, she brought, and Saul's a perfect example. He did not care that the Spirit of the Lord, how, how, how hardened is that? Didn't care that the Spirit of the Lord had departed from All he wanted to do was look good in front of somebody. If you're, if you're wanting to please people or you want to get people's approval, you're headed straight down. And something she didn't mention. You remember when David came out uh, and, and they, were, they were squared off against the Philistines and they were in the Valley of Elah and old uh, Goliath was out there mocking Israel. He said, what about your God now? And, and David, David, was just, uh, David was actually brought forth because uh, Jesse had to at a, at a particular time. But David come out and said, what is this uncircumcised Philistine doing ranting and raving about my God? He said, isn't there anybody around? I'm paraphrasing. Isn't there anybody around that's going to take him on? David said, I'll take him on. I'll take him on because I know I'm not doing it myself. I'm going in the spirit and the power of the Lord. But watch Saul. He said, here. He said, here, take my armor. Put it on. Listen, Saul was just, just the way he's described. He was a head taller than everybody. Saul was probably about six, seven, six, eight, And the average... Jewish man was somewhere around 5'10". Well, David was even smaller than that. When you take somebody maybe 6'6 six, six, six to 6'8", six, David was probably 5'5 five, five to 5'7", five, 5'8", seven, five, somewhere now. And you, you say, this big old guy walks over in his armor and says, here, take my armor and put this on. Well, Saul knew good and well that his armor wasn't going to fit David. But you know what Saul wanted? He wanted to see, he wanted the people of Israel to see the king's armor walking out to fight the giant. See? He said, I want to look good in front of the people. I want people to see my armor going out there because often a distance people, yes, there's our king. He's going out to fight. But old David, he said, huh, I had proved this. I can't wear this. This, this doesn't, basically he said it doesn't fit me, but he said, I haven't proved it. So he just stepped out with his sling and his five stones. And he walked out, and he squared up to the giant. He, 
Basically what he did, church, he stood up to pride. He said, pride, you're not going to take me down. Because he said, you come to me with the sword, but he said, I've come to you in the spirit of the Lord. And he said, that's who's going to take you down. I'm not. He said, all I'm going to do is pick up my stone. I'm going to swing this around a few times. He said, I'm going to let it go, and the Lord's going to direct it, and he's going to take you down. He said, because it ain't nothing to me. If David was said, I can do this, I can do this, Saul would have up there and squashed him like a bug. But he said, I know I can't do it. In church, we can't do anything on our own. Please don't, please, please don't think that you can do anything on your own. With us, things are impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And we serve a God of the possible, not the impossible. Hallelujah. Wonderful message. I was glad. I was glad in a way I didn't get to hear it before because I got to hear it with everybody else. So. Praise the Lord.